So today, to give you a head start, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5. You can turn there. We're going to have the verses on the screen. Or there's a QR code right in front of you. And this QR code is going to take you to our website. It'll take you right to the outline that I'll be teaching from. It'll take you right to the verses that we'll be studying this morning. And that way you can make your notes on your device uh, if you don't want to do them in your set of scriptures there. This will also take you to a Connect card. And that is uh, your way of communicating with me. You know what? A lot of times you think, well, I shook the preacher's hand. He'll remember that I was there. No, you know what? I need you if you're one of our guests today. Would you do me the kindness? It, all it asks for is your name and your email address. And just say, you know what? I was here today. It gives you a place to say, you know what? Would you pray for us? We're going through this at home. Would you pray for us? We're new in the community and we're looking for a church home. Would you pray for us about a job? Whatever the case may be. And we'll add you to our prayer list that our staff has and we will begin to pray for you. That's your way of, of letting us know you're here and of communicating to us what your needs are. All right? So you let that take you to that. All right, so... Miracles. Here's the foundation that we laid several weeks ago when we started. We said, okay, number one, Jesus was not into show business. He never did miracles to put on a show. He was not from the South, where if you were from the South and had the abilities that he did, you know what you'd say, don't you? Hey, y'all, watch this. Right? He never did that. Never put on a show, never did it to draw a crowd, but he did it to reveal who he was. Almighty God, who stepped off the throne of heaven and came to this earth as a person, as a man. He was all God and all man at the same time. And we can't begin to get our arms around that and understand what that was like. But that's his identity. He came as the promised Messiah. Generations and generations ago. In scripture it was all the way back in the third chapter of Genesis. Where God says I will send a deliverer. A redeemer. A Messiah to you. He was God's promise to mankind. So he used his miracles to, uh, to, re to reflect his identity. He also used his miracles, and we really hit on this last week, to demonstrate his power and his authority. Remember last week? He demonstrated his power last week over demons. He demonstrated it last week over disease. Remember how many uh, sick people that he healed? But he also used miracles to demonstrate that he had power over nature itself and even death. And so this week, we'll get to a new segment of that. This week is about nature itself. But there was always in every miracle a lesson, a teaching, a parable, if you would. And so the lessons in today's passage are absolutely huge. Now, we could camp out right here for at least a month and never touch on the same thing. But we're going to do a flyover today. And I want to teach you all five of these things. All right? I'll go fast, but I, it'll probably take me to 1 o'clock. But if you'll just be patient, we'll get all of them in. All right? Luke chapter 5. And so let's begin in verse 1. All right? In verse 1 of Luke, it says this. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Look at verse 1 again. So it was as the multitude. Listen, the word was spreading fast, especially after what he did when we studied last time. Remember, he was in the synagogue there at Capernaum when a demon-possessed man confronted Jesus in the synagogue. And Jesus cast the demon out of that man. Now that'll shake up church right there. I'm going to tell you what. People went away from there thinking, oh boy, 
synagogue was never like this before. Wow. And then he goes to Simon's house and he healed who? Simon's mother-in-law. He had taken her in and she had a high fever there. He healed her. And then in the evening when the Sabbath was ended, the whole town brought everybody that was sick. And in Simon's house, right there in Capernaum, he healed every person there. News was spreading fast. And so crowds were there. People, it says here, they were pressing on him because they wanted to hear him teach. Remember last week we talked about how different he taught than the rabbis? The rabbis would always quote what other rabbis said. They would always base what they were saying on the opinions of other rabbis. But Jesus taught with authority because he wrote it. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and you skip down, the same, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's known as the Word. He wrote the Scriptures, and so he taught with authority, not like the other rabbis did. And so the crowds were, were pressing in. They wanted to come see. They wanted to hear. Look at verse 2. He had an issue there. A lot of people. And uh, how do I speak to a large crowd? And he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them. And they were washing their nets. Listen. Washing their nets was necessary. You had to do that after an all night of fishing. Because you would throw the nets out and then you would drag them and draw them together. And as those nets drug across the bottom of the lake, they'd pick up weeds and sticks and growth. All, and the nets would catch and tear. And so every morning after a night of fishing, the fishermen, as tired and as sleepy and as hungry as they were, would stretch those nets out. And they would pull the weeds and the slime and the mess out of the nets. They would repair the broken parts. And they had to do that. They stretched them very taut on the ground there so that they could dry. Because if you didn't do that, the nets would rot and break. You know, what good is a net if you've got uh, a catch of fish and it breaks on you. It's not very useful. So they were busy doing that. And uh, verse 3. So he gets into one of the boats. How many boats are there? Two boats are there. He climbs into one of the boats. Which happened to be of all people. This is Peter's boat. So he gets into Peter's boat. And asks him to put out a little bit from the land. Now, why was that? Well, there was a large crowd there. He needed a little separation, but it was for acoustics part of the problem because as he would back off from the shore a little bit, as he would speak, it would bounce off of the water and almost create the effect of an amphitheater. And so his voice was amplified and everybody that was there could hear him as he taught. So it was a big deal there. And then he sat down and he taught with authority not like the rabbis did. And here's another uh, reference to the crowd. And the multitudes from the boat. He taught the multitudes from the boat. Simon. Now think about Simon. Here he is. He's grown up on the lake. All he knows is fishing. And he knows that lake like the back of his hand. You ever notice people that are really good fishermen? They know where the fish are. Right, And if you've ever gone fishing with somebody that really knows the lake or really knows how to fish, you realize how quickly you don't know how to fish. Because they can just, they can catch a fish anywhere. anywhere. I had an uncle like that. And he would take us to the lake and he would, he would always tell me, he says, well, you got, did you spit on your worm? Well, if you don't spit on it, no, a fish ain't going to bite. He'd say, watch this. And I'd, I'd been fishing for an hour or two. He walks down there, spits one time, throws it out there, and about two minutes has this huge fish. He said, mm -hmm, you got to spit on your hook. Fishermen just know how to do it. 
And that Simon, he grew up on the lake. Fishing was his life. It was his business. When you were a fisherman, you made good money if you knew what you were doing. It was a very profitable business. And you got to stop and think, what had he just witnessed? He had just witnessed Jesus healing that demon-possessed man in the synagogue. And then he went home with Simon for, for Sabbath lunch and he healed Simon's mother-in-law, right? And then that night at Simon's house, Scripture says the whole town brought everybody that was sick and everybody that was demon-possessed. And so Simon is watching all of this happen at his house and he watched Jesus heal every person. You think he's just a little bit curious? You know, now Simon is not one, he's never in Scripture ever been quiet, right? He's never had a filter on his mouth. I mean, if it's, if it's in his head, it's going to roll out the hole in his mouth, and he's going to say exactly what he's thinking. And so he's seen all this. I wonder, I wonder what was going on in his heart as he was watching Jesus heal. I wonder what he was hearing God speak to him as Jesus was teaching. Huh. But you know what? He said, hey, Simon, hey, would you come get in your boat and row me out just a little bit? Could he have chosen the other boat? Sure he could. Why do you think he chose Simon's? Was it just the luck of the draw? I mean, was Simon's a little bit nicer than the other boat, you know? Or could it have been, could it have been Simon had to row it out there so he had a captive audience, right? Simon, hey, listen, I know you're busy mending the nets and cleaning them. Come here just a minute, I need you. Row me out just a little bit. Now, Simon couldn't, do anything but listen. Simon had to give Jesus his full attention. You see, Jesus had something to say to Simon. And he didn't want anything to get in his way of listening. Here's the first lesson that I want you to see. Here's the first thing I want you to go home with. Jesus wants your full attention. See, this is what he was maneuvering Simon to the place where Simon couldn't do anything but listen to what he had to say. And you know, there's a transferable teaching and principle here for us today. Do you realize that Jesus desires the very same thing from each one of you every day? Every day he desires to speak to your heart. Not just Sunday mornings. Not just for the 30 or 40 minutes that we study together. But do you understand that Jesus wants your full attention for a period of time each and every day? Now, most of us don't give that to him because we just don't feel like that's necessary. We've come to church. That's enough. See, you believe in the gospel of enough. And that's one of the parts of it. You know, I've gone to church. That's enough. But Jesus wants your undivided attention. The ones of us that attempt to be with God every day, most of that crowd doesn't give him our undivided attention. We try to multitask. People will say, well, you know, I talk to God as I'm driving to work. Great. Well, you can pray and drive. I understand that. But he doesn't have your full attention. Because you're watching traffic. You're thinking ugly thoughts about the guy in front of you. I mean, there's all sorts of things going on. But he wants your full attention at some time during the day, during the morning, during the evening, when you're at your best. When are you at your best? Some of you are morning people. Right? How many of you are morning people? Let me see your hands. Yes, yes. You, when the alarm goes off, boop, eyes are wide open. Yes. The alarm goes off, you could carry on a full conversation within two seconds. Yes. 
How many of you are married to somebody who's not a morning person? Let me see your hands. They say ugly words to you in the mornings, don't they? Yes. Even though that alarm has gone off, it means nothing. Even though I am on my way to the coffee pot, that means nothing. Jamie and I are exact opposites. Guess who's the morning person? Guess who's not? And you know what I've learned to recognize in these years? Hey, good morning while she's pouring her coffee. <laughs> you ever seen that? If you have a brain cell in your body, you understand that that means, ah, give me time. Give me a minute. I'll be back. He wants your full attention. He doesn't want you to multitask. He doesn't want you to just use your time at church and say, well, that's good enough. He wants your full attention so that he can talk to you. Not just for you to talk to him, but for him to be able to talk to you and teach you and love on you and encourage you and instruct you and correct you and give you guidance and, and, and direction. Isn't it funny that we call ourselves believers, but yet we usually don't give him the time of day. He wants your full attention. But he wants you to give it to him freely because you love him. Because have you ever noticed that God has a way of getting your attention when you don't give it to him? Has he ever had to get your attention? There are lots of ways for him to do that. And he will do whatever's necessary to get your attention. Because he so desires that time alone with you every day. Here's the first lesson. He wants your full attention. And you know what? That may be how God speaks to you today. The greatest message that you hear from this miracle may be, you know what? God's been dealing with me about being alone with Him every day. And this just confirms it. And starting in the morning, I'm going to meet with Him every day. Let's keep following along here. Verse, pardon me, verse 4. When He had stopped speaking, He said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now you've got to put yourself, you just got to, be there in the boat with, with Simon. Here's a carpenter from Nazareth, which is 20 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. A carpenter is telling a professional fisherman, I want you to row out in the middle of this lake and I want you to let your nets down for a catch. Well, number one, that showed his ignorance. Because you don't fish in deep water in the middle of the day. That's, you'll never catch the fish. You fish at night around the shore in the shallow water where they're feeding. And you can just catch them by the dozens. All right? But Jesus has asked him to go out into the deep water in the middle of the day. You want me to do what? Are you kidding me? That's not how it's done. And if Simon were a Baptist, do you know what he would have told the Lord? Lord, we've, we've never done it that way before. Absolutely. And so this doesn't make sense. Have you ever stopped to realize how much of your life is governed by whether you think something makes sense to you or not. Think about that. We'll get into it a little bit more in just a minute. But most people, when they read this verse, 
they miss the biggest part. It's not about where he's asking him to fish. It's not about what time of the day he's asking him to fish. Do you see the promise that's in this verse? You see it? Say it if you see it. If you'll obey me, there's a catch. He's already promised them a big catch. They just have to do what? Obey. <laughs> Whether it makes sense or not, all you've got to do is what? Obey. All right, look at this. Simon answered him and said to him, Master. All right, time out. Master. Master doesn't mean master like you think of the word master. This is a word of, of, of respect. In, in, for us, it would be like saying sir. Right? I was brought up to say sir to, to, any, to any man. When they would say something, you would say yes, sir. If you didn't hear what they said, you said sir. It was respect. And that's what he's saying here. Sir. We've toiled all night long and caught what? Nothing. Nada. Zero. Zippity. da. Now the rest of that sentence says that means we've got nothing to take to the market. The rest of that sentence says we're not going to make any money this morning at all. The rest of that sentence says we struck out. Ah, we're tired. We're hungry. And just as soon as we stretch out these nets, we're going home, we're going to eat a quick bite, and then we're going to bed because of what? we got to get up in just a little bit and fish again tonight. Master, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, what? At your word. Another way to say that is, nevertheless, because you said so. Because you said so, I'll let down the nets. He's submitting to Jesus' authority. Now, this is all that we have. This is all that Luke wrote. And who's he writing about? Peter? When has that been the only words that Peter has spoken? What's Peter saying when he walks over to the guys mending the nets? How does he tell them? All right, guys, throw them in the boat. What? Put the nets in the boat. Why? He wants to go fishing. Who? The carpenter. Just put the nets in the boat. Let's go. So he gets them in the boat, and here we are. We're rowing out to where the fish aren't. We've toiled all night, but at your word, I'll let down the net. Now, here's something that you've forgotten. And this plays in to Simon. Is it just Simon, Andrew, James, and John, the other fishing team? Those are the two boats that are there. Is it just Jesus and those four? Have you forgotten about the what? The multitude. And they're all doing what? Watching and listening. That's why Peter's telling the rest of these guys he's doing like this so the crowd can't see what he's saying. Put it in the boat and let's go. Right? Peer pressure. He's got to do it now because what? Five or ten people are watching? Oh no, there's a what? There's a multitude. <laughs> Put it in the boat. Come on, let's go. Peer pressure. Oh, look at this. Verse 6. And when they had done this. Done what? Put the nets in the boat and rowed out there. You know, some of the writers describe these nets. At, some of them are as much as 100 feet long. Right? And so they would row out into the deep if they were fishing in deep water or wherever they were fishing. And they would begin to stretch the net and set it 
And then they would begin to row and draw the net together. And that's where it would pick the gunk up off the bottom and hopefully catch some fish in the process. So when they had done this, they're out in the deep, uh, they've let down the nets and they're beginning to draw them together. They caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. <laughs> All because they just did what? They obeyed what he asked them to do. But wait a minute now, it didn't make sense. When God asks you to do something that doesn't make sense, you don't have to do it, right? No, it doesn't work that way. He expects us to obey him even when it doesn't make sense. And they caught a great number of fish. Have you connected the dots? What's the dot in verse 6? And the dot in verse 4 that are connected. What was the promise in 4? I want you to do this for a great catch. What's the result in verse 6? Great catch. They caught so many fish. God always keeps his word. He always keeps his promise. And so they signaled to their partners, verse 7, in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both their boats so full that both of the boats began to sink. Here's a second lesson in this huge miracle for all of us. God expects us. God expects each believer to completely obey Him, even when it doesn't make sense. He expects our obedience. See, when, when you're reading your Bible and God tells you to do something or asks you to serve Him in a way or challenges you to be a part of something, we use a set of filters before we obey. Well, you know, first of all, I've got to say, does this even make sense? Because if it doesn't make sense, boop, I'm done, right? I want you to pray for your enemies. Well, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. I want you to forgive the people that have hurt you. Ah, wrong. I'm not doing that either. That doesn't make sense. See, it doesn't pass that make sense filter. And so I'm not doing that. And I don't even feel guilty about it. Because it doesn't make sense. Well, if it passes the make sense filter, then the next filter that it goes through, is it what I want to do? Because just because it makes sense, what if I don't want to do it? Well, then what? I'm not going to do it. I'm just, and God understands that that's not me. And we operate on a series of excuses. Well, I'm too tired, I'm too busy, I have to work, my kids are playing ball, and there's, there's always a good excuse. Now here's what our mind does. If the excuse makes sense to us, if it sounds good to us, then we think it makes sense to God, and God will look at, out of heaven and say, hey, don't worry about it, I got it. Sorry to have bothered you. It was a dumb idea. I don't know why I even asked you to do that. Yeah, my bad. If it makes sense to you, then it's got to make sense to God. And God will say, well, it'll be okay. Huh. Really? <sighs> you know what the main issue is? Life's all about me. My obedience to God is filtered through me. Isn't it? Yeah. That's why you don't have a time alone with Him in the mornings. Right? Because you don't want to get up early or you're too tired at night or you're too busy or you're at the ball field with your kids or you've got an early morning appointment or... There's always 20 great reasons. And they make sense to you, so you think it makes sense to God. And God says, that's all right. You don't need to do that. Because life in our eyes is all about one person. Who? Me. Yeah. 
And you know what? God says, I want you to obey me. Whether it makes sense or not. Think about it. Just real quick. Think about it. All through the scripture. All through the Old Testament and everything else. Nothing made sense. But God just simply asked people to obey him. Did it make sense to tell Noah to build a boat? Because it was going to rain. And there was going to be a flood. What's rain? It never rained before. Build a boat? For what? He's not near the ocean. He's not even near the Sea of Galilee, the lake. He's, he's in a totally different part of Israel. Did any of that make sense? But all he asked Noah to do was what? Obey me. Just obey me. And that's the way it was when he called Abraham. Abraham was 1,500 miles away from the promised land. And he called him and said, Abraham, hey, listen, I want you to follow me. And I'm going to take you to a new place. And I'm going to make a nation out of you. Where are we going, God? Just follow me. 1,500 miles later, that's the promised land. Wow. Wow. All you've got to do, Abraham, is one thing. Just what? Just obey me. I wonder what it is that God has spoken to you about, challenged you with, asked you to do, that you've never obeyed yet because it doesn't make sense, because you're too busy, because it doesn't fit you, and it's not what you think you would like to do. I wonder... This week, what you could get alone with God and say, God, I'm so sorry I've put it off and avoided it for so long. Here's my what? My yes. Let's keep reading. We left in verse 7. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it. What is it? Saw what? The great catch. Oh, he listen, he's a professional fisherman. He's grown up on the lake. He knew he's never seen a catch like this before. He knew this wasn't normal. This wasn't natural. This was an act of God. When he saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Oh, what? Lord, wait a minute. Now, a few verses ago, he called him Master. But now, he's used a different word that's translated Lord. A few verses ago, it was out of respect. And he said, Sir, this is the word that means Almighty God. That means Messiah, Redeemer, Kurios. You've heard that Greek word before, translated Lord. Peter is recognizing who he really is. This is the Messiah. This is the Redeemer. This is Almighty God in the flesh. And what was Peter's first response? He fell at his feet and he says, Get away from me. Why? Because I'm a sinful man. Here's the lesson in this one verse. Always remember who you are. You see, our pride keeps us from realizing who we are. Our pride wants us to think, man, I'm a great guy. I'm a great dad. I'm a great pop. You know what? Uh, I, I'm a great employer, employee. I'm a great student. I'm a great child. You know, we, we've got this bloated image of ourselves. We very rarely realize who we really are. And we don't see, because of these blinders of pride that are over our eyes, we totally can't see the number of times that we disobey God every single day. The number of times that we disappoint God every single day because we're not who He wants us to be. And we're not doing what He wants us to do. We come home at night. We've had a good day. I made an A on an English test. I made a great contract sales today. Man, I've had a great day. And we've totally lost sight 
of who I am spiritually. I'm still a sinner. I may be saved, but I'm still a sinner that needs forgiveness, that needs cleansing. But until I see myself for who I really am, I'll never see my need for who he is. Peter realized who he was. I am a sinful man. Depart from me. I'm not worthy for you to be in my boat. I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. And God, I'm not worthy of the blessings that you've just given us. Do you understand how much money is in these two boats? Do you understand the profit that's in these two boats when we go to the market with all these fish? God, I'm not worthy. Until you see yourself for who you really are, you'll never understand how much you need Him. How much you need that time alone with Him. And I wonder maybe if this is why so many believers don't have that time alone with Him every day. Because we don't see the need. Oh, I can multitask. Or I can, you know, Sunday morning is enough. I mean, and not every Sunday. I mean, come on, please. Yeah, I come when I can. That's good enough. Huh. Always remember who you are. Because until you constantly remember who you are, you will never understand how much you need Him. Look at verse 9 and 10. For He and all who were with Him were astonished. They were amazed, is that word, at the catch of fish which they had taken in. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Oh, listen, this miracle wasn't about because Peter was in financial trouble and needed some extra cash. This whole miracle wasn't about Peter and his family were wanting to go on vacation and they needed that extra vacation money so these extra fish will come in handy. No, the whole miracle wasn't really about the catch. It was all about the calling that God had for Peter. He says from now on, and he, he, he's relating to him as a fisherman, right? They just made a great, what, what was the word that was used several times? A great catch. And he said from now on, you will catch men. Catch fish, catch men. And that word catch men, if you translate each word of that little phrase right there, it means catch for life, not for death. You catch fish because you want them to be dead and you want to eat them. But I want you to catch men for life. This is my purpose for your life, Simon. And that's the lesson, not just for Simon, but for all of us. God has a purpose for each one of our lives, right? And His purpose for your life and for my life is not your job. God did not create you in your mother's womb because Huntsville, Alabama needed one more school teacher, needed one more insurance salesman. <laughs> needed one more engineer. Right? God created you, and when He created you, He gave you a certain set of gifts and talents and education and experience and abilities, not for you to make a living, just for you. Now, you can use it to make a living, but He gave those to you so that you would have the means to serve Him. Why is it that so many of our believers are nothing more than spiritual spectators? You know, the statistics tell you that 
in your church if 20%, just 20% of your church are serving. 80% of your church. Now, not the people on the roll that the FBI couldn't even find. But I'm talking about the ones that come. 80%. I want, if that were true today, 80% probably from all the way over here to this aisle, proportionately probably this many people out of this crowd are not involved in serving God in any way. You just, you just come. I love the music. I like the teaching. I want to learn. I want to see my friends. But I'm just a spectator. Proportionately, it would just probably be this many people that are involved in serving the Lord. How do you think that makes God feel? You think that disappoints him? You think that displeases him? We never think about that. Because we only think about one person, which is who? Me. As long as I'm doing what I want to do, when I want to do it and how I want to do it, then I'm pleased. And my pride-filled blinders thinks that I'm doing great. Hmm. One last verse. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 said, So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Forsook all. Some of the other uh, gospels will use the phrase, they left everything. They, they gave it all up. This huge business they had. It was a partnership. It wasn't just Simon, who was his, the single fisherman. No, they had pulled two families together. And the sons of Zebedee and Simon's family were partners in this fishing business. And now, at one point in time, they said, You know what? I'm walking away from it all so that we can follow him. Here's the teaching for Simon for those other three, and for each believer, it's this. Salvation is all about surrender. It starts with surrender. And that's what this is a picture of. Simon had just recognized the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah when he submitted to his authority and called him, My Lord, Curios. Right? That's salvation. But salvation is not an event, it's a lifestyle. Surrender is not just saying, Lord, I give you my life. And then for the next 10, 20, 50, 80 years, however long you live, you do what you want to do, how you want to do it, because life's all about who? Me? No. It's an ongoing process. Lord, I give you my life. That's surrender. That surrender. God, I'm putting my life in your hands. God, I want to be the person that you've created me to be. God, I want to serve you in every way that you desire me to. God, I don't want to live by what I want and what I like. I want to live by what you want for me. Hmm. If you've never given your life to Christ, salvation is not about coming to church. It's not about, you know, being a part of Shop with a Hero, as good as that is. No, salvation is about surrender. And I don't care how many times you've been to church. I don't care how many small groups you've been a part of. I don't care how many denominations you've been involved in. It's not about any of that. It's about that point in your life when you say, I realize who I am. I am a sinner and I'm separated from God. Just like Simon Peter realized, God, I am a sinner and I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. God, I want you to, to be my Savior. I want you to be my Messiah. I want you to be my Redeemer. God, I want you to come and live inside of me. Make me part of your family. 
God, I want to be your child. That's what surrender is all about. And if you've never made that commitment, that life-changing, radical commitment of surrender, that's your greatest need today. You need to say, God, I want to do what pastor's talking about this morning. I want to give you my life. Wow. And I hope you'll do that. A lot of you in here today are believers. In your heart and in your mind, you can go back to that point in time when you made that surrender of your life to the Lord. I want you to know, surrender did not end for you on that day. It only begun. Has only begun. Alright? It's got to be a part of your daily walk. Every, every, every single day. See, God wants you every day. God, what do you want from me today? God, how do you want me to serve you today? God, who do you want me to talk to today? We talk about being Jesus with skin on. God, who's going to be able to see Jesus in my life today? God, I give you my life when? Today. Does that mean you get saved all over again? No. It just means... God, I want you to know I'm putting my life in your hands today. Thank you. I don't deserve that, but I want you to use me. That may be your greatest need today as a believer is just to reaffirm that lordship in your life. To reestablish that master-servant relationship. See, that's what Lord means. You would never have a curios, a Lord, if there were no doulos, which is the word for servant. Without a servant, you wouldn't have a Lord. You wouldn't have a Lord without servants. They work together. God, I want to be your servant today. What a huge miracle this is. I wonder which of these five lessons God spoke to you about today. Which of these did he put his finger on in your life? What is it that he wants you to begin to obey him of these lessons today? Close your eyes and let's pray together.